And now please, if you would turn to Psalm 107 for our second reading this morning and for our text for this morning. Psalm 107. Take up the reading at verse 1 and we'll read to the end of the psalm. Psalm 107, reading from verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. O oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of meat and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men, and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turneth rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground. A fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell that they may prepare a city for habitation. And sow the fields and plant vineyards 
which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Again they are menished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. The righteous shall see it and rejoice and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Whoso is wise, and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to that reading <coughs> of his own precious word. Our text this morning is verse 6 of that psalm. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. He begins in verse 1. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. It is our duty, is it not, is the duty of all men to give thanks unto the Lord for his goodness, his great goodness, for all the things that they enjoy. The Apostle Paul, he tells us in uh, Romans chapter 1 that one of the reasons why the wrath of God lies upon humanity is because of its simply for this one thing its unthankfulness to be unthankful to god is um, is a sin one of the problems that a so-called atheist faces is that when he or she feels thankful they have no one to give thanks to but surely as believers, as those who have enjoyed the blessing of God, the salvation of God, whom God has blessed in their souls, brought to eternal life, to forgiveness, all the good things that God bestows upon us in his salvation, it's our duty to give thanks to him for his goodness, for whatever our circumstances may be, God is good, we are not but he is, he is everlastingly good. He is good and his mercy endures forever because he's a merciful God, that's what he is. And even if he never ever saved one single soul from beginning of creation to the end of it, he would still be a merciful God. But it's out of that mercy, not out of any compulsion on God's part, simply out of his mercy, the mercy that he, merciful God that he is, well, he has brought salvation to us. So it is our bounden duty, whatever our circumstances might be in every day and generation, to give thanks to God for his goodness, for his merciful kindness that endures forever. As he is everlasting, so too is his mercifulness. He sent his son to bless the world. He sent his son to bless you, even this morning. But that blessing, salvation that is, has to be, has to be received, has to be received by faith. The hand of faith must reach out, trusting, receiving the blessing, receiving the salvation of God. He sent his son to redeem his people, says the psalmist from a from the hand of an enemy from a strong hand from the enemy of, of satan the snare of the devil a hand from which we could never be rescued unless a stronger hand reached forth and drew us to himself and so verse 3 the psalmist he tells us that he gathers this is a post-exilic psalm this is um uh, God gathering his people from all the different nations to which they were scattered as a result of the exile and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. But even today now uh, the gospel has come to the Gentiles and now even now from the four corners of the earth through the preaching of the gospel in all the world. 
God continues to gather his people, his elect, from the four corners of the earth. He brings us, verse 4, he brings us through our wilderness experience. Verse 4, they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. This was Israel of old. You don't have to go very far in the Old Testament of the Bible when you find some reminder of God's delivering his people through that wilderness experience. And their wilderness experience is ours too. We're in a wilderness also. We're looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. And just as he protects, preserves, and just as he br brought his ancient people through that wilderness in the Old Testament, so he has promised to bring us through it too. Uh, they had no city uh, to look forward to. Of course, they were looking for the land of Canaan. But of course, we have the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let not your heart be troubled, he said. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. It's God's sovereign plan that you, every child of God in this room this morning, you will one day be where Jesus is, in that place that he has prepared for you. Nothing will stop, nothing will hinder that. Hebrews 11 verse 16, But now they desire a better country that is unheavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. This is not our dwelling place, beloved. Get out of your attachment to it. You're leaving it behind. We've got another dwelling place to which we are heading. And so here in verse 6, in their distresses, in their troubles, again and again, it's repeated throughout the psalm, go over it again yourselves sometime today. But again and again, they're in distress, whatever the cause of it, they're in trouble, they're in distress, they cry out to the Lord and he comes to them and he delivers them. The cry to the Lord, but it's a cry of faith. It's a believing cry. Crying out to God for deliverance. So under the title, The Cry of Faith, three things, the cry for, the trouble, and the deliverance. We'll take the trouble first. He delivered them from their distresses. Where do those distresses that we encounter in this world where do they come from? Well, they come, they come to us right from the very beginning, from our mother's womb. They're with us from the womb to the tomb. Job, he says in uh, chapter 5 and verse 7, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upwards. The moment that we leave our mother's womb, come into this world, the first thing that we do is we start crying. And wherever you find humankind in all of God's creation, there you will find trouble because that's where our troubles, that's where our distresses begin. Because there in our mother's womb, that's where life begins, contrary to the murdering abortionists. That's where life begins at the moment of conception. And that's where your sin career begins too. You're conceived, you're born in sin. Psalm 51 verse 5. And we come into this world with sinful natures out of which comes nothing but sin until that is, but that is for the grace of God in the gospel, sovereignly, powerfully, mightily coming to us and changing those natures by the gospel, by the Spirit of God, causing us to be reborn, as Jesus terms it, born again, changing those natures, putting the life and the love of God into our souls. 
But even then, even then the troubles don't stop altogether. They're, they're with us all the way through right to the very end. Verse 10, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Death is, is, is trolling us all, all the way through from, from beginning to end. Man born of a woman is born to trouble. And no matter what his experience is, no matter what his achievements might be, no matter how high he reaches in this world, there's always that thought, death, death, death. He knows that he's going to die. He clings to this one life that he's got because he knows he's going to die. And it spoils everything. It spoils everything, uh, all his achievements, his holidays, his best times. It doesn't matter. It's overshadowing him every step of the way. And then, and, the, and then it finishes, it ends in the bitterness of death. Unless, unless we are delivered from death. Unless we are given another life, unless we are given eternal life, unless we are turned out of our sin, unless we are turned out of those old natures in which we are conceived and born, unless we are born again of the Spirit of God and made new creatures in Jesus Christ. That's what matters, that's all that matters, being a new creature. In Jesus Christ and so there in the tomb there in the womb rather the seed of destruction is planted there at conception verse 20 he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions the seed of destruction is planted in us at conception and all we begin to, to walk through this world and our pathway is the pathway of destruction unless that is we are turned out of it by the Lord Jesus Christ. Enter ye at the straight gate, he says, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. That's the pathway that we are on as natural born sinners. And many there be which go in there at the multitude, the most, the, the, the majority of mankind, that's the end of them. That seed of destruction is in them and works in them and they walk in the pathway of, of it and they end up in eternal destruction. Unless that is. They enter through the straight gate in the narrow way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Unless we are turned out of that pathway of destruction by the sovereign grace and working and operations of God in the gospel, crying out in faith, in the trouble. All our troubles, they come out of that one single source, the one common denominator that binds the entirety of humanity together. We are all of us sinners, conceived, born, live, die in sin, but for the grace of God. It's the result, all our afflictions, every one of them, verse 17, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, because of these they are afflicted. That's where our afflictions come from as a result, the psalmist says, of our transgressions, a rebellion against God, that is. Transgressions, iniquities, the twisting, the perverting of everything that's good, everything, every good gift that God gives to us as sinners we take and we use in the service of sin. We pervert everything, every good thing that God gives to man. And as a result of that, that's why, we're why are things so hard, people say. Why, why, do I, why do I suffer this? It all comes out of the same source. Man sinned. The problem is theological. Until we see our need of getting right with God. 
until he, verse 27b, until he brings some kind of a storm into our lives and brings us to that place where we're at our wit's end and we cry in faith to him through his son, Jesus Christ. The cry of faith. Verse 28, then, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. Darkness, death, again verse 10, trolls them. All that you've got to look forward to, but for the grace of God, it's appointed unto man once to die, marked in God's calendar, the day, the hour, the moment when you breathe your last it's on his calendar. You go out of this world, pointed unto man wants to die. After that then comes the end of the distresses, the end of the afflictions, the end of the troubles. No, just the very beginning of them. Because after this, then comes the judgment. So the source, the source of your affliction, the source of all our troubles, sin in which we were conceived in which we were born and in which we live all of us unless that is the grace of God has intervened and brought us out of the cause not the effects out of the cause of all the trouble you get rid of the cause and you get rid of the effects but man all the time he wants to he wants to address the effects. Take away the effects, he says. Take away the distresses. Take away the afflictions. Take away the trouble, he says. Take away my misery, he says. But refuses to address the cause, sin. That's the source of the trouble. And so what's the cry for, verse 6? Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. The cry, the cry for the grace of salvation, maybe perhaps for someone here this morning, I don't know. Experimental salvation, I mean. I mean the experience of God's salvation out of the darkness and into the light, out of that old nature, out of Adam's nature, and into a new creation. That, that salvation, I mean. May, may, let me ask you, where you got your salvation from? Did you get it in the fire? Did you feel, did you feel uh, the weight? Did you feel the, the, the guilt of your sin? Did, did you feel the wrath of God? Did you experience that wonderful, that great relief when, when the burden of guilt was lifted off of you? Or are you living maybe on the back of somebody else's faith? You know, like Moab, uh, Jeremiah, he tells us that, um, he tells us that Moab was at ease from his youth. He was Lot's son, you know, and um, he lived off of the back of his father's faith. His father knew, his father knew what he'd been saved from. I mean, he was, he was the man who was dragged almost by the scruff of his neck out of Sodom and Gomorrah. He still had the, he still had the smell of sulfur on his clothes. He knew what he was saved from. He saw, he saw hell raining down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew what he'd been saved from, but his son Moab didn't. He had his father's religion, but he didn't have his father's grace. He didn't have his father's salvation. So maybe, maybe, maybe your cry this morning is, is, is for salvation. To experience God's salvation for God. God to deliver you. Not just from your troubles, but for the cause of your troubles. That old nature in which you were conceived and born. Or maybe for grace, you know, to trust the Lord, you know, as we go through this wilderness, even as his children, even having been reborn, we're traveling through this wilderness, through the, this veil of tears. And, you know, you look at the experiences of, um, 
of, of God's ancient people as God brings them through the wilderness of old, the places that they visit, uh, they come to Mara, that place of bitterness, terrible disappointment. They've just come out of Egypt and it's all gung ho. Uh, Miriam, she's got the tambourine and out, out and they're singing and they're dancing. They've escaped from Egypt. But then, three days later, the reality begins to bite. They're in a wilderness, quiet, still. No vegetation, no water, no food. They come to Marah and they're bitterly disappointed. And they rebel against the Lord, against Moses' servant. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Why didn't you leave us to die there instead of dying here in this wilderness? As a believer, you've not been to Mara. Well, you will be eventually. Mara, the place of disappointment. Bitter disappointment sometimes, maybe. Health issues, sickness, maybe even unto death. Disappointment education, business, employment, family breakdown, many, many of the disappointments that God's people, God's people face as they travel through this wilderness, just like Israel of old. But the question is, will we trust in him? Will we cry to him for grace? Will we cry to him for help in the face of those, those disappointments? Will we let him use them to mold and shape us, to grow us in our trust of him? Or will we rebel against him in the midst of those disappointments? And then he brings the people of Israel, he brings them to that place called Rephidim, where the war begins against Amalek. That war, says the Lord, uh, will continue on, he says, from generation to generation. It's that old war of the ages against the world. And you're not long as the Christian in this world, not long after you've been reborn, before you realize that the world doesn't love you. That in fact that the world hates you. That warfare, Jesus he tells us in Luke chapter 14, you're going to be a disciple of mine. Well, he says, in effect, you're entering into the mother of all wars and you will need grace to get you through it. That warfare continues on today. But as I visit churches week after week, I don't see very many soldiers armed for the fight, armed for the battle. I don't see many Christians taking the fight to the enemy. Soldiers, soldiers of Christ willing to endure hardship as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And then of course, well, they come, sometimes they're brought to Elam, the place, you know, palm trees and wells, times of refreshing, and the goodness and the grace and the kindness of God. But it's a wilderness and we need grace. We need to cry to him in faith for grace, for his presence to go with us. After Israel sinned with the, you know, with the golden calf. Uh, the Lord says to Moses, in effect, he says, Moses, he said, this wicked people, this rebellious people, he said, I promised them that they would get to Canaan. They'll get there. I'll fulfill my promise. But you take them. I'm not going with them. Get out of it. And Moses cries to the Lord. He says, no, no, Lord. He said, unless you go with me, I'm not going anywhere. Better I die here than you don't go with me. Through this veil of tears, beloved in Christ, all our troubles, all our distresses, we need to covet. We need to cry. We need to seek to him for him day by day for his felt presence in our consciences, in our souls. 
gracing our lives, strengthening us, and enabling us to go through this wilderness, not rebelling against him, but trusting him every step of the way to bring us to glory. Or maybe for somebody it's grace, a cry for grace to overcome bewitching sin. It has a bewitching effect, does it not? The carnality that fills, I say, fills uh, assemblies, call themselves Christians today. The worldliness that has been brought into the church, it's, it, it's music, it's dress, in, in every which way. Grace to overcome and to walk that narrow pathway. To be just simply to be Christians, to live as the New Testament portrays a Christian to be believing God's word and living God's word. That's, that's our calling, that's what we're called for. Verse 9, for he satisfies the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. A cry for grace to overcome that bewitching sin. Tell me it's not bewitching. Heard the story just recently of a man I listened to him many times, a minister in North America. Wonderful ministry. Now he's, he's lying in a jail cell somewhere. Sexual immorality at the back of his ministry. And even now, as he's confronted with the reality of his sin, he sits there in denial of it. Totally bewitched. Tell me you don't need grace as you go through this wilderness. Lord, take away the blindness. Any blindness that there is with me, take it away. Open my eyes to see the reality of sin in my life, of anything that keeps your presence from me. Grace for spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding that we might walk worthy of his calling. In these dark days, showing ourselves to be worthy of his calling, Verse 11, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. See, that's the end of, of re rejecting the counsel of the Lord. You read God's word? You hear God's word? Maybe even regularly. But let me ask you, when's the last, when's the last time you felt the power? When was the last time you felt the power of his word? Huh? When was the last time you felt it convicting you? And turning, turning you by the grace of God back to him. To cry out to him. To seek, to seek his face again. Is that not the need of the church today? Uh, broadly speaking, uh, beloved, grace to, to revive us. To remove the declension, the decadence, the deadness that lies upon us. To return us to our first love. To love God with all our heart and to love our neighbor. I mean, what, what does that look like? A vibrant church, a vibrant people of God that are taking a storm in the world with the gospel. Is that you? The declension, the uncleanness. The backsliding, churches and denominations that are folding to sexual immorality, embracing it even. I mean, it's not even a grey area, we're talking black and white. Huh? Filthiness, uncleanness in his church, decadence, deadness. I mean, there, there are something, there's something like an excess of 40,000 churches in the United Kingdom today. I mean, you would think that would make some kind of impression, would it not, on this nation? It doesn't even cause a ripple. Do you think maybe there's something missing? 
maybe the Holy Ghost. I suggest to you, beloved in Christ, it's time that we, God's people, sought his face and cried out to him for grace, that he would come and begin with us and remove the declension, the decadence, and bring us back to our first love. Because I tell you, the faintest, the faintest cry of a child of God is heard. In the midst of your distress, in the midst of your trouble, whatever it might be. As a mother with her child, I, I, I heard uh, a minister, he's, he's long gone now, but he used to have a, he used to have a Tuesday morning uh, service where he... Uh, he spoke to, he addressed the, the women folk of the church. Uh, and his wife would be next door in the next room. She would be looking after the children belonging to the women folk. And he wasn't very, uh, very his hearing wasn't very good. Uh, and he said he would be speaking, he would be addressing the ladies. And all of a sudden, in the middle, in the middle of the meeting, he said, one of the ladies would get up and walk out into the other room. And of course he realized straight away what it was. She'd heard the cry of her baby. He didn't hear it, but she heard it. She heard the cry of her own child. Motherhood is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Huh? We're murdering that too, are we not? Huh? The faintest cry of one of his children, God hears. He'll answer you. He'll come to you. Faith. The cry of faith. Maybe grace, you know, for us to fulfill that great commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Oh, there are many hindrances, I know. You might even get locked up, but hey, what does it matter? To go and tell Sheffield, Sheffield of their sin, to lift up your voice and cry aloud. Spare not, tell them of their transgressions, of the one who's mighty to save even Jesus. Oh. We've, given, we've given place, have we not, to the, to the devil. Eh? He has his way in the nation. The Lord Jesus, when he was tempted, he was tempted um, just the way the church, the church is tempted today. Three times he was tempted. He was tempted to turn the stones into bread. But provide, provide bread for yourself. Yeah. So today the church's temptation is uh, give, over, well, give over with all this preaching. Yeah. Food banks, that's the way to do it. Food banks, you know. Provide the, the, the homeless and the destitute. Provide them, with, provide them with, with, with bags of food. Jesus says, "For I, I came to preach the gospel. For this reason I came to preach. I must go to other cities too. Preaching the kingdom of God, bringing the kingdom of God. That was his call. And nothing would divert him from it. And that's the call of the church too. A woman in Carlisle just two or three weeks ago, I was preaching there on the street. A woman came to me. She was in my face, right in my face, angry, raging, hurling, bawling at me, telling me, asking me what I was doing and what I had done for food banks and the like. And I said, ma'am, that's not my calling. My calling is to preach the gospel. Jesus would not be turned away from that. He would not turn the stones into bread. And we will not set up food banks, but we will preach the gospel to them. Yeah. He was tempted, of course, um, uh, to turn well to the political realm. All the kingdoms of this world, says Satan, I'll give to you. You can manage them, you can be the head of the, all the nations of the world, if you'll just bow down to me. They were already his anyway. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. He came 
He came to preach the kingdom. He came to bring the kingdom of God. Not to be involved in politics. That's not the church's call. It might be your personal calling. It's not the church's <coughs> calling. So he comes three different temptations, one after the other. The last one, of course, was performance. Performance. Jesus, become a temple jumper. Yeah, you jump from that temple, he says, the angels catch you. Think of the converts that you'll win. And hasn't, oh, hasn't the church today swallowed that one, eh? How many assemblies in the name of Christianity will be gathered throughout our land today and it will be nothing but a performance, entertainment. And they'll come in their flocks and of course that justifies it. Yeah. We're filling up the church, that justifies it. They come unbelieving and they go out unbelieving. Temple jumpers become temple jumpers. With three verses from Deuteronomy, Jesus drove the devil from his presence, defeated him. What do you think you could do with a whole Bible? Hmm? The cry for grace to fulfill as the church the Great Commission, the call that God has placed upon his people to preach the gospel in all the world. It's quite simple, it's not complicated. We make it so. But it's very simple. Preach the gospel in all the world. So the deliverance, we're still in verse six. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them, deliverance, out of their distresses. Notice uh, in the verse, will you, that the, the, the term Lord is in capital letters. That signifies the name Jehovah. And the J-E of Jehovah, sorry, the J-E of Jesus is an abbreviation of the name Jehovah. Jehovah Jesus. He, Jesus, delivered them from their distresses. What does the name Jehovah signify? He's eternal, the eternal Son of God, who always was, is, and shall be, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's changeless, he never alters, his mind hasn't changed, his word hasn't changed, nothing about him has changed. He is faithful even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. He is a covenant-keeping Lord and God. We don't keep covenant with him, but he keeps covenant with us and delivers us from all our distresses when we cry to him in faith. He's the one that we needed to begin with and he's the one that we still need today and we will need all the way through the wilderness right to the end. He has made a covenant, Jehovah that is. Psalm 89 verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen, with my elect, with my people whom I have redeemed. I have made a covenant with them. That is a, a, that is a, a covenant of grace. That is a, a covenant that is inviolable, that is unbreakable that is even unilateral. That is to say, he keeps it because we don't. And if he didn't keep it, we never would. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my, my servant. Not only has he formed the covenant, not only has he established the covenant with us, not only has he chosen us, given us to his son, drawn us to his son, but he adds an oath, he swears to his servant David that he will keep that covenant. Beloved in Christ, whatever your distresses, your troubles are, I tell you this morning, you are as secure, as secure as anybody could possibly be in all of creation.
over and again throughout the, the Old Testament. He remembers, he remembers, he remembers his covenant. He remembers the word that he spoke. Cannot forget it. But added to that, he has sworn. And when God swears on something, it's, it's a sealed deal. What? I mean, what more, what more could we ask for? What more could he do for us? Huh? How, could, how could we not love him? How could we not serve him? How could we not abandon ourselves, give ourselves to him? What's the matter with us? Huh? He made that covenant, made that covenant with Christ first of all. Covenant with his son, Jesus Christ. That he, that he would come down into the sin-cursed world and redeem us, his people. Die on that cross, bear the curse, take the shame. Take the, endure the wrath of God upon himself. Take our sins upon himself and give to us his righteousness. And it's a covenant of grace. Grace, free, free, free grace. Free gratis. No cost to you but of an estimable cost to God, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That's why we're able to cry in faith to him. That's why we're here this morning, because we've been purchased at great price, because this has been opened up to us, the way into the presence, the divine presence accessible to us because of the blood of God's Son. He has purchased all these blessings for us. Huge cost. And adding, and adding that oath to it as well, he, he sent his word, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them for their instruction. But what was the history of Israel of old, eh? He sent his word to them again and again. He sent the prophets. They stoned them. They hacked them to pieces. They, were, they rejected the word of God. And so many of them, majority of them, perished in the wilderness. They rejected his word. They rejected his minister. He sent his word and he, he sends his word to you this morning. He sends his word to you again this morning. What will you do with it? Huh? What will you do with it? He sends his men. He raises up ministers. Okay, there's few we could do with some more, but uh, he still raises up his ministers and he sends them to you to bring the word of God to you. He sends his gospel to, to bless men and women the world over. He sends his gospel, he sends it this morning to bless you. His blessing is salvation. He sends, it, he sends his servant, he sends his gospel to bless you. But the question is, will you receive it? Will you receive it? That's the only way, that's the only way that it, it's received. You know, men say, I, I hear men say, uh, uh, I trust, I hope they'll learn better in time, but I, I hear them say, you know, just give, just give your heart to Jesus. Just give your heart to Jesus, they say. Beloved in Christ, never in a million trillion years will any sinner ever give his or her heart to Jesus Christ until they have received his heart. Then and then only will they be able to give their heart to him. But that's where it begins. Receiving. Receiving. Jesus. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him, but to them that did receive him. To those that believed in his name, to those who trusted him, to those who cried in faith. Those who received him, he gave them 
the power, the wonder-working power, the miraculous power to be changed out of that horrible sinful nature in which we were conceived and born and out of which comes all our troubles and all our afflictions delivers us as he promises to do in the gospel receiving Jesus you receive the love of God you receive the forgiveness of God. You receive all the blessings that God has for a human being. But without Jesus, you have nothing. Nothing at all. Reception of him is reception of God, is reception of everything, is reception of that heavenly home, that heavenly mansion. Eternal glory. And he turns the wilderness, he turns it into a, into a meadow. Verse 35, he turns the wilderness as a standing water, dry ground into water springs. Pours down his spirit upon you. The life-giving spirit of God. Love in you, life in you, lasting joy in you, as the hymn writer says. Not in this wilderness, not in the broken systems of this wilderness. You go drink your fill at them, they just leave you mocking, they just leave you, they pour scorn on you and leave you more miserable and more afflicted than ever you were before. When you go to Jesus, you receive Jesus and he turned your wilderness into a meadow. He turned, he put life, he put love everlasting into your soul. Life eternal and joy unspeakable and full of glory. He lifts the poor, verse 41. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. Lifts the poor in spirit, broken, wounded by sin, disappointed, disappointed so many ways. He brings them into his family, makes them family members. Huh? What a bless! Consider this, will you please, this morning. Uh, whatever the troubles are, you know, in your own personal life, but you know, even in your church, if I if I might say, um, to be a member of God's family, to be a child of God, to be delivered out of that old sinful nature today in this day and generation is that not a high privilege huh? this world is perishing this nation is going down the drain we are in the last of the last days the judge is before the door he's coming on the clouds of heaven and if you're a child of God today, if you're a member of God's family today, that is so precious. Such a privilege. Faith. Faith fetches righteousness, the righteousness of God. And joy, verse 42, the righteous shall see it and rejoice. Because of that righteousness given to them, not their own, the righteousness of Christ. And all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Joy. Love, life, joy. That's the gospel. That's what it brings to you. And you come to know verse 43 to understand the loving kindness of the Lord. You come to experience, that is, experimental salvation, the experience of the loving kindness of the Lord. There is nothing like it. Nothing to surpass it. The merciful kindness of the Lord to a vile, ruined, lost, undone sinner like me. 
What am I and who am I that I should enjoy such an experience as that? To be loved with everlasting love. And that's you if you will receive Jesus by faith. The cry of faith. Call to him in faith. Believe and cry, cry, cry. They cried and he saved them. Read it over and again in the psalm. He cried. They cried and he saved them. He delivered them. Psalm 27 verse 8 that we read. When thou saidest, seek ye my face. How did your heart respond to that? The psalmist, he says, My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Beloved in Christ. Huh? Beloved in Christ. Cry. Cry. Seek his face. These are days in which we need to be seeking the face of the Lord. We should be doing that all the time, constantly. But particularly so today. Wisdom, wisdom, verse 43, whoso is wise. Are you a wise man? Are you a wise woman? The Lord Jesus Christ, he says in Matthew eleven twenty-five, he said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, the clever don't get to see it. They're too smart. They're too self-righteous. He says, and hast revealed them unto babes. Childlike, humble faith. The humility of faith. Not the wisdom of this world. That leads to nothing. That goes nowhere. But the wisdom of God leads to salvation. The wise man, the wise woman, that's her. Jesus says, Matthew 7, 24, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, these, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, a wise woman, which built his house upon a rock. That rock, Jesus, immovable. I tell you, Every kingdom, every empire, every nation, every institution of man will fall before King Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. But I tell you, your every trouble, your every distress, your every sin, even your sinful nature, should you cry in faith to Jesus, should you call upon him, should you receive him in faith, I tell you, your sins, your troubles, your afflictions, your distresses will fall before his name too. Cry, cry, cry. Then they cried unto the Lord Jehovah Jesus in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. There's a God in heaven. The world doesn't recognize that. And he's merciful and his mercy endures forever. And I can say that before you this morning. I can declare that mercy before you this morning because he is yet merciful will always be and will have you and will receive you if you come to him in the way that he has prescribed through his son through Jehovah Jesus calling the cry, the cry yes we can cry in our distresses and our afflictions but it's the cry of faith it's a trusting cry it's a cry to the one whom we can trust to the uttermost to deliver us. An assured confidence, that is, that he, Jesus, can, will deliver me from my distresses and from my sin. He is to be trusted to the uttermost and is able to save you and deliver you to the utmost. 
of your sin, of your guilt, of your distresses, and of your troubles. But you must cry, and you must cry in faith, believing, trusting in Jehovah Jesus, the mighty, mighty Son of God, able to save, able to deliver. Call upon his name today. Do not delay. Amen. Sing as we come to a close this morning number 500.